of Wildlife or Crow. My name is Rachel Rainbow and I'm the Education and Outreach Director here at Crow and it is my pleasure to uh, have all of you visiting us today via the <laughs> Facebook live session for this week's Wildlife Wednesday. Now the topic of this week's session is going to be on wildlife rescue assessment since as of right now with the current COVID health crisis, Crow is having even more challenges than what we usually do in getting animals to our door. And so we want to empower you all as our public to be able to identify when an animal needs to be brought into Crow and if it does, how can we get it here safely and quickly as possible. Now the way that this session is going to go is first I'm going to talk a little bit about the wildlife rescue assessment portion of it and then I will finish up with some wildlife handling tips. So a little bit of a brief reminder from last week's session on Gopher Tortoise Day. Crow is Lee County's only licensed wildlife hospital and so each year when we do admit those nearly 5,000 animals a year they are coming from primarily Lee County but sometimes even from all over southwest Florida. And so it's our job as an organization to provide the necessary medical and supportive care to try and get as many of these animals back out into the wild as possible. And when we have you all out in the community right now, you are our best eyes and ears for wildlife emergencies because right now we need you all as the public to assist us in our work. We are still functioning every day as a hospital, but we are in dire need of you identifying when there is an animal in distress. So all in all, in order to become a, a wildlife hospital, you do have to have certain licenses and permits to be able to give these animals care. And we know that there are many very well-intentioned people out there in the community identifying animals. So if you do come across an animal, please be aware that you, you need to turn them into us as the licensed professionals. Now, if you are curious where there are wildlife rehabbers, if you're not from Lee County, but if you're listening from other parts of Florida, if you go to FWC's uh, website, Florida Fish and Wildlife's website, they have an injured and orphaned wildlife page on their website and you can download the list of licensed rehabbers in your area and we can make that PDF document available to you after the session today. So if you find a wild animal that you believe is, sometimes you may or may not know what you're looking at and so that's why the first thing we want you to do if you come across an animal that's in distress is to call us because when you call us we have a rescue hotline that is staffed from the hours of 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. seven days a week so regardless of the whether or not it's a weekend or a holiday or a religious observance we are here to assist you so we will teach you when it is appropriate to rescue versus leave it alone because sometimes people come across an injured animal that might be doing something that we would interpret as being a little odd, but it just might be their normal course of living. And right now, because so many of us are um, at home more frequently than what we usually would, we're actually getting to witness uh, wildlife behaviors in action, whereas we usually might not be able to do so. So the first thing we're going to do is assess the animal. Now, when you're assessing the animal, you first and foremost want to have a rescue, wildlife rescue toolkit handy. And right over here, I have uh, what... So the first thing that we're going to need is gloves. Now, gloves can be even your basic gardening gloves. They can be anywhere from wrist gloves all the way to gloves that go a little bit higher up on your forearm. The importance of gloves is because these wild animals do not know that you're trying to help them and obviously they may try to bite scratch and or claw you to protect themselves depending on the type of the animal so having gloves handy is an important aspect of wildlife rescue 
The other thing you're gonna wanna have is uh, glasses or goggles. Again, uh, with these animals biting or scratching, if they become scared, uh, sometimes they might also try to go for someone's face depending on the animal. So having appropriate goggles or glasses uh, is also important to keep you as your finder and rescuer safe. The most important part of any wildlife rescue toolkit is a way to get a hold of the animals. So what we use in our arsenal every day is going to be hand towels, sheets, bath towels, anything where you can toss it over and get a hold of the animal. You also have nets. So if we have any fishermen out there who have nets that you use to scoop fish that you've caught, those act as great nets for wildlife rescue as well. And then finally, we have crates. So if you have any old dog or cat crates, they work great as transportation containers. Because the, the biggest thing about transportation containers is you want them to be of an appropriate size that the animal can comfortably sit in and breathe in, but you don't want one that's either too small or too big to cause further issue. If you don't have any plastic crates available, Another thing that works great is any cardboard boxes. So if you've been ordering a lot from Amazon Prime recently, save those boxes, collapse them. Those can be great transport containers. When you call us and you have your rescue kit handy, the next thing we're gonna do is ask you a set of questions over the telephone to figure out what the animal is and if it genuinely needs help. Now, right now, this time of the year, we happen to be in breeding season. And so we're getting a lot of calls for nuisance wildlife. Now, Crow is not a nuisance wildlife removal service. So when you call about an animal, per Florida Fish and Wildlife, a nuisance wildlife would be one that is described as it is about to cause property damage, present a threat to public safety, or cause an annoyance to a property owner. So if what you have is a nuisance wildlife, then you need to call a trapper and coordinate with the trapper to get an animal relocated from your residence. So Crow will not come out and just relocate an animal for you. Uh, some common uh, examples of nuisance calls would be if there are things like raccoons, possums, or squirrels on your property. Oftentimes those animals, particularly during breeding season, tend to hang out in residential areas that provide them a readily available access to food. So, um, or if it's a time of the year when they're having babies. Since parents have to eat quite a bit more food during breeding season, because they're not only feeding themselves, but they're also feeding the babies. Uh, we're also getting calls because it is breeding season about babies that have fallen from the nest. So. I know that when I was growing up around here in Southwest Florida, I was always told if you find a baby, whether it be a bunny, a bird, a squirrel, a possum, a turtle, if you touch that baby, the parents won't want it anymore. And so at Crow, we actively educate the public that that is not true through our If You Care, Leave It There campaign, trying to reunite these babies with their parents. And you all as the public can help us do that. Now the first thing that's important about reuniting babies with their parents is realizing little growing up my parents would just let us run around outside and they're like be back by dark you're a reptile so uh, with reptiles typically once the mother has deposited the eggs in the nesting site and covered them up the babies are on their own from the time they hatch until the time they die so if you happen to come across a baby uh, snake a baby turtle a baby lizard they're on their own so please don't bring in baby reptiles to us unless there is something visually wrong with them. 
Now with animals like baby birds and baby mammals though, the age in which you are finding them would be really important with that wildlife rescue assessment. So um, when you find a baby, again, you're calling us, but a couple of things that you are not doing, uh, please do not ever provide food or water to a baby animal. Because although there is a lot of information out there on uh, websites like Google and Yahoo and Bing, uh, they do not always provide accurate information. So you as the finder may be trying to help out this baby, but doing more harm than good. So please, if you find a baby animal, do not feed it and do not provide it any water. So the first type of baby that I'm going to cover over here is baby birds. So right now here at Crow, uh, we are dealing with baby doves, baby ducklings, mockingbirds, rackles, blue jays, loggerhead shrikes, hawks, and osprey. So we're getting the full gamut of our songbirds, our water birds, and our predatory birds. Now when you have baby birds, there are three important stages of their growth and development. When they first come out of the egg, they're known as either a hatchling or a nestling. If you find a hatchling bird, oftentimes they will be bare, they will not have any feathers, um, or they will start to be getting in their downy fluff, which is their baby feathers. At that stage, the babies should be in the nest the entire time. If the babies have fallen out of the nest, or if a predator has removed them from the nest, they have to be uh, put back or brought into crow. The second stage of their growth and development is the fledgling period. When a baby bird is fledging, they are starting to grow in what we would consider normal bird feathers. And so at that point, they're starting to, um, they're gaping their mouths open very widely. They're sitting up and they're starting to stand. The final stage of the growth and development for a baby bird is the juvenile stage. That's when they, for the most part, look like a small adult. They have flight feathers and they're getting the least amount of care from their parents. Um, this is when they're starting to uh, jump out of the nest, hold out their wings and learn to fly. So this is usually when we get calls from people when babies are transitioning from that to renest it but the nest may be destroyed you can construct construct a temporary one that the parents will utilize for the birds so the first one that I'm is the cup nests so this is what we usually think of when we are talking about uh, the mockingbirds the grackles the blue jays the cardinals they tend to be in the stereotypical cup nest Usually this will be made out of twigs, uh, nesting material, uh, groomed out feathers from the parents. And so that's what they're usually hiding in in the tree. Now as a nesting alternative, if the nest is destroyed, you can construct a temporary one. For the cup nesters, little baskets work great. This can be strawberry baskets, these can be uh, little wicker baskets or Tupperware. Now, when you are placing this nest back in the tree, the important thing to remember is you want holes in that basket. So the holes need to be big enough to where if it rains, then the rain can get through, as well as if the birds defecate or go to the bathroom, then they have some place where that fecal material is going to drain. This is your cup nest. Now your cavity nesters, like your uh, woodpeckers, your eastern screech owls, your American kestrels, the parents like to build their nests inside holes in logs or, or dead or dying trees. So if the tree happens to fall over, the nest is no longer there. 
if you know where the nest site was or where the tree was, you can make a cavity nest box for them and hang up in the tree. So this is an example of a cavity nest box. Around here at Crow, uh, we are trying to upcycle materials as, as frequently as we can. So if you do have a dead nesting tree, you can even utilize the remnants of that tree and build your own cavity nest from the same uh, tree. And that will actually increase chance that the parents will come back and take care of the baby since it was the original nest tree. And then the final nest that we're gonna talk about is the cavity nest. Now this is the type of home with uh, birds that you would need some help to get put back. So these are gonna be your eagles, your ospreys. This is the nest right here. These tend to be in much higher areas, uh, anywhere from 35 to 50, 60 feet in the air. And so Crow partners with different landscaping companies and tree trimming services to put these types of nests back uh, where they were found. Okay, so um, now we're going to cover the baby mammals. Uh, we are getting in a ton of bunnies right now. Uh, bunnies are one of the cutest babies that we, although we think they're all cute, one of the cutest babies that people tend to find right now because it is warm out. The mother bunnies um, have more access to food. We do have two different species of bunnies that we get here in Southwest Florida. We have the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit and the Marsh Rabbit. Now with your mammals compared to your birds, there are really two main sources of growth and development. You have that initial uh, neonate or pinky stage of uh, mammals where they're hairless right now, their eyes aren't open, and then you have the juvenile stage. So once mammals start to develop fur and their eyes open and they move around, they're a lot more self-sufficient than when your birds would be. Now your, the physical capabilities of babies when they're small and neonates or pinkies is they can't really move very well. So if you happen to come across a bunny nest, you'll be able to identify it. Now, unlike bird nests, bunnies, uh, do not live in warrens or big deep burrows here in southwest Florida. The mothers end up just digging small depressions in the ground, pulling out their fur, gathering nesting materials, and covering the bunnies up. So we're getting calls right now of people just mowing their lawns or letting their dogs outside in the backyard to go to the bathroom, and then they end up finding these babies. When you try to reunite these babies, this is gonna be a little bit more challenging to um, identify whether or not the mother's coming back. Because unlike birds who come back every 15 to 20 minutes, mother rabbits only come back to the nest uh, site about twice a day near dawn and dusk. The reason why she is not actively foraging uh, near the nest during the daytime is because that would draw predators to her nest where the babies would be vulnerable, especially if they're at that smaller stage of growth and development. Now, when you are uh, re-nesting birds, the parents will even continue to feed the babies from the ground, but parent birds will not relocate their young. Versus if you find a disturbed nest of bunnies or squirrels, um, the mothers if uh, will re relocate them, I'm sorry, they will relocate them if you find the babies and keep them near where they were found. If you are trying to draw the attention of the mother, the other thing that you can do is play vocalizations or play baby noises um, so that they know exactly where you have placed those babies for safekeeping. For birds, there's a great website, Cornell Bird Ornithology. They have a bunch of vocalizations on there, uh, totally free for the public that you can play. Um, and then for baby bunnies, if you go on like YouTube channels, oftentimes you'll be able to get nice uh, baby calls from there too. Uh, with possums, uh, we are also in possum season. Now, unlike baby bunnies, the mommy, uh, the mommy possum carries the babies with her the entire time while they're growing up. Now, ladies, the gestational period of a possum is only about two weeks. 
So when the babies are born, they crawl up the mom's belly hair and they stay in a pouch until they're of the size where they can start taking care of themselves. So right now we're getting babies that are coming in anywhere from that small neonate pinky size all the way to the juveniles where they have fur on them. Now, if you find an injured mommy possum, um, if you could do a favor for us and check her belly to see if there are any babies in the pouch, uh, the babies will not leave the mother if the mother becomes injured or killed. And if the babies are left nursing on the mother, that's very bad for them too. And then we're also getting in baby raccoons. And so if you're from up north originally, if you find a raccoon out during the day, that means that it might have some type of systemic disease like rabies or distemper. But down here in Florida, particularly in our coastal communities, mother raccoons will actually go out foraging for food during low tide. Uh, animals, wild animals are very opportunistic. They go wherever the food is. And so these mothers, because again, they can have anywhere from three to six babies per group, uh, they're, they need to get enough food, not just for themselves, but also for the babies. And so the mothers go out during those low tides to forage for invertebrates like crabs and shrimps and crayfish. Okay, so those are kind of the main babies that we're getting in um, here at Crow right now. So if you find a baby, follow those tips to give the best chance for reuniting with their parents. But again, call Crow during that process so we can go into further details with you. Now for animals that aren't babies, but that are adults and otherwise injured, not, uh, not small, there are certain tips that you can go about handling them that are safe for you all as the finder, as well as for the animal in question. Okay, so um, at Crow in a year, the majority of our patients are birds. So about 60% of our caseload is birds. So I'm gonna cover some bird handling tips first. Now again, talking about coastal communities, we have a lot of water on all sides of us. And a lot of us, since we're at home uh, more frequently, might be periodically going out on the boat for fishing. If you happen to see any birds like pelicans or gulls that are uh, injured, there is a safe handling tip for them. I'm gonna get my towel. Now again, the towel is your important wildlife rescue handling tip, um, uh, handling gear. We want to be able to toss a towel over the type of the bird. Now with water birds like pelicans, gannets, anhingas, cormorants, they do not have nares or nose holes, so they're obligate mouth breathers, which means in order to get in air, they have to open mouth breathe. So when you are handling a pelican or a gannet, a frigate bird, an anhinga or a cormorant, make sure that once you have the head covered, you are leaving the mouth open. This can be done with those gardening gloves and when one or two fingers are placed in between the upper and lower beak. That means that you have a safe handling of the animal, but you're still allowing it to breathe. The next thing when you're handling birds is you are going to want to hold their body as though their wings are fully, uh, wrap, uh, their wings are resting naturally as they normally would be as they are sitting. Uh, bird skeletons, bird bones are hollow. And so if you rearrange their wings or handle them funny during transportation or rescue, you might accidentally cause a wing injury. So the best way to handle them is going to be as though their wings are resting naturally on their body. Okay, so the next thing is going to be our birds of prey. It's uh, osprey nesting season. We just got in two juvenile ospreys uh, this morning who have both fallen out of their nest. With predatory birds, they are significantly more dangerous. So um, with those birds, uh, if they are um, injured, again, call us. If it's a situation where we feel you as the finder can safely toss a towel over that animal and get it into a container, we will talk you through how to do that. But if it's a situation where it's significantly more dangerous, um, we will try to dispatch um, one of our staff to, to get the bird from you. 
again, uh, we do have limited resources right now since we don't have volunteers that are actively rescuing for us. But the way that we would go about doing a predatory bird rescue is by tossing a towel over, just like you would with the pelican, and going from underneath and trying to get a hold of the talons. The talons are the most dangerous part on a predatory bird, and so that is the thing that is going to need to be uh, handled first and let go of last when you're putting it into a container. Okay, now we're gonna um, go through our mammals. So again, we talked a little bit about um, mammal babies that are being born right now, but not necessarily handling techniques with them. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna talk about is the raccoons. So raccoons, especially babies, are very cute animals. Uh, we all love them here at Crow but raccoons are what is known as a rabies vector species. And what that means is that they don't necessarily come in for diseases like rabies or distemper, but they all have the ability to catch these diseases. And that's not just limited to raccoons. That includes raccoons, bobcats, otters, skunks, foxes, and bats. So if you find any of those types of animals, please do not try to approach them um, because they might potentially get you sick. They might be able to pass on diseases to you. And so uh, because if we don't have somebody available to go out and get it from you, then you can call a licensed wildlife trapper that can come out and get the animal from you. With possums, possums are probably one of the easiest animals to rescue when they're injured because uh, through their natural defense mechanism of playing dead, the easiest thing to do is you'll walk up to a possum, toss a towel over it, and stick it into a box. When possums play dead, they will open their mouth, they will show you all 50 of their teeth, they'll start drooling, and then they'll start secreting um, a substance from their rear end to make them smell like they're dead. Uh, they won't move, and so they're the easiest things to toss a towel over and get into a box when it comes to your mammals. Now, if you noticed, I did not include possums on our rabies vector species list like I did our raccoons and the other ones. Possums, because they're a marsupial, they, uh, their body temperature is too low to where it is highly unlikely that they will actually contract the rabies virus. So it is a very safe animal for our general public to assist us in the rescue and transport of. Okay, and then the last one we're gonna cover is our reptiles. So reptiles make up about 10% of our patients in a year is all. Uh, so we get a lot of turtles, tortoises, and snakes. So those are the ones that I'm going to talk about with handling and restraint. Now last week with gopher tortoise day, we talked about gopher tortoises. Uh, the vocabulary we used was the carapace, the plastron, and the bridge. Now, if you come across a turtle or a tortoise trying to cross the road, the safest thing to do would be to assist it in the direction that it is going. Now, if it is a gopher tortoise only, you may safely grab the turtle by the bridge and move it from point A to point B. Now, if it is any other turtle besides a gopher tortoise, so if it is a soft shell turtle, a snapping turtle, uh, cooters or sliders, they may try to bite you. So instead of grabbing it by the bridge, like you can with a gopher tortoise, we do what's called the caudal hold. So just like with everything else, you would toss a towel over this animal and the caudal area or the tail end area, you would grab it by the back of the shell, put a hand underneath and move it in the direction that it's going, just like you would with your gopher tortoise. Uh, snakes. I'm sure a lot of our viewers are not fans of snakes. Uh, snakes can be very scary, especially if you don't know what type of snake it is that you're dealing with. Uh, at Crow, we also have a cell phone at our first response that we can provide to you that you can text us pictures if you want further identification. But the safest way to assist a snake, if you were going to, would be to grab it from behind where the jaw bones are so that you have control of the head, and then you would want to support the body. Now, once you have uh, the body contained, a good safe 
uh, transport container is a pillowcase. You would stick the snake in there and then you would tie off the pillowcase and then bring it to um, Crow. And then the last reptile that I want to talk about is going to be our alligators. Now alligators have the potential to be very, very dangerous. And so if you find an alligator, um, the thing to do would be to call Florida Fish and Wildlife's allega uh, alle nuisance alligator hotline. So uh, with this hotline, uh, FWC or Florida Fish and Wildlife will dispatch somebody to come out and assess an alligator. Um, if it is in need of medical attention, they will coordinate the appropriate wildlife rehab uh, facility to take it to. Uh, but if it is a nuisance alligator, then they will safely remove and um, uh, remove the alligator from the area so it is no longer causing a issue for our guests, for our residents. There's also a link on Florida Fish and Wildlife's website called SNAP, which is the statewide nuisance alligator program um, that has all of that contact information and details on it. So those are kind of the common calls that we're getting right now. Uh, once you have uh, worked with us to assess if an animal needs to be brought into us and it's contained, the next thing we will tell you to do is how to take it to one of our uh, partner veterinary clinics. Since our hospital is physically located here on Sanibel Island, not everybody has the ability to bring animals out to us. And so we work with 10 different dog and cat clinics peppered all throughout Lee County. If you visit the website, there is a tab on that website that says found an animal. If you scroll through the page, it will let you know where the closest uh, drop off point clinic to you is. Uh, once the animals get brought to the drop-off clinic, they finally get brought out to us here for their medical attention. The animal is provided a patient number that will be assigned to them in the order that they arrive, and it will remain with them the entire time they're here. And from that, we will prescribe the necessary medicines and or bandages to get them better. And as it comes time for animals to be assessed for re-release, we will attempt to take them back to as close to where we found them original as possible. However, not every animal that comes into Crow is gonna be able to get make a full recovery. And so if we find that an animal has received a permanent debilitating injury and it would make a good captive animal, we would assess its ability to be an educational animal here at Crow or if we don't have space for it to be brought to another wildlife center, zoo, or aquarium across the country. And because we're gonna try to feature a wild animal in every one of these sessions, the one that I brought with us today is Gigi. Gigi is our ambassador possum. Uh, we're gonna bring her over here. So this is Gigi. Gigi came into us when she was very young. She actually celebrated her year birthday in January. Um, I know she looks pretty big to be a year, but possums, again, they only live to be about a year, maybe two in the wild. And so they reach adulthood at six months old. Now, when Gigi came into us when she was small, she had sustained a lot of trauma to her tail. So she's actually missing her tail. And possum tails are very important to their survivability in the wild. And so without that, Gigi was deemed non-releasable. So she is utilized at Crow for educational programs, as well as out in the community at uh, outreach events. Now, if you have any questions in the comment section below, if you uh, write them down in the comment section, we will answer them as we're going through. But thank you so much for joining us for this Wildlife Wednesday session. If you are interested in supporting Crow, uh, you can make a donation on our Facebook page or you can go to our website at www.crowclinic.org to the Donate Now tab. Thank you so much and have a good day.